Hey, welcome to Socialism for All. Today's date is June 16, 2020. And uh, first of all, my apologies for a lessened output stream in the last few weeks since the George Floyd, George Floyd protests slash national uprising that that morphed into have developed. Um, well, it's just been a wild ride. And I think I've only done two videos in the last three weeks. I'm making a point of trying to get that output back up again as we get into summer. Just generally, you know, as I, you don't need to hear from me, but 2020 has just been a wild ride. We started with the Australian wildfires, uh, the Democratic sham of a primary, Bernie Sanders bending over for Joe Biden, uh, coronavirus, which of course this video is about, uh, and then the, well, the economic crash worldwide associated with the coronavirus, which some countries are able to handle better than others if they have government intervention and or, you know, actual socialism that is capable of managing the economy on behalf of the people, not capitalists. Um, but yeah, it's just been a wild ride. And of course, part of that economic crash was the United States government saying, here's 1200 bucks. It should last you 10 weeks and maybe you can get unemployment unless you're an essential worker, in which case get to fucking work. You don't have a choice. And what happened? The country exploded. Obviously, the tipping point was the George Floyd murder, which was a gratuitous, cruel, sadistic, violent murder that was captured on film. It was slow. It was torturous. It was painful. And uh, it, it was a spark that lit the gunpowder, that lit the Mount Everest-sized pile of ki dry kindling that has just been piling up in the United States in the form of deep, deep inequality, uh, racial tensions, and just resentments across the board that basically stem from capitalism. This deeply unequal, deeply unfair, deeply unjust situation, which has to some extent going been going on for centuries, this racialized system of genocide, slavery, and then wage slavery that continues to have deep uh, racial and gender inequalities embedded within the overall class hierarchy of capitalism. So you throw that into, I mean, you have that situation, you throw the coronavirus, you throw the rigged primary of everybody who was socially aware and was trying to do something to, you know, get health care for people and, and to get involved, as Bernie Sanders had suggested. And then, um, you know, you tell everybody to just stay home, stay bottled up in your houses. And by the way, we're not going to feed you. Boom. You know, um, and so we have an uprising that, as I said in a previous video, I've been wondering, you know, when, when, when this was going to happen for a while. But um, so now I think I'm finally getting back around to some videos I had planned before these uprisings started, and I just kind of want to clear them out, and I'll keep doing the audiobooks and and other things like that, um, you know, and also keeping up with the situation as it develops. I share a fair amount of good stuff over at facebook.com slash socialism for all for some kind of current event stuff. Um, it's just, it's all happening at such a blinding pace. It's, it's really quite something. So COVID-19, though, is what this video is about. You may recall, it's hard to like for me to even process uh, what's going on this year. It's major events are happening so quickly. As Lenin said, there are decades where nothing happens and then weeks where decades happen. We're in one of the latter right now, for sure. Throw in murder hornets and, you know, uh, whatever else is going on. There was a possible massive denial, uh, distributed denial of service attack on the United States yesterday, like Instagram went down for a while, wild, wild stuff going on. But so before the George Floyd protest, there were other protests, right wing protests, Tea Party type protests that were the reopen protests, free America, reopen America. Never mind the fact that there's a serious, serious disease that is highly communicable, ravaging the country, causing deaths and organ damage. Uh, just reopen. And I had this video planned, which basically got into some articles covering who is funding these protests, because 
just like the Tea Party. They are funded by the very rich for in the interests of the very rich. These are not pro-worker protests. I'm sure most of you listening to this know that all, that already, that they are bourgeois-funded, petty bourgeois-enforced protests, and those are the people showing up is the, the wealthy Karens who want their hair cut, and they don't care if we, the working class, proles, have to go out and risk our lives to do it. You know, we want to protect ourselves, and we want to stay home, and they're basically saying you're, you know, essential or non-essential, and if you're non-essential, we'll pay you something, but as soon as we say go back to work, you have to go back to work. And uh, obviously, there's been some conflict about that. Now, those protests have died down, obviously, the reopen ones, as the country is engulfed in literal flames uh, by the tidal wave of righteous anger sparked by George Floyd, I think fueled by so many, so many <laughs> resentments. Um, I mean, how do you get to a situation like like a, the George Floyd murder? It's that didn't happen overnight. The fact that that cop even felt empowered to do that is rep representative of a long lineage and evolution of a system where cops are fascist militias that are completely out of control in this country and have been perpetrating that kind of racial violence. It, I mean, they'll kill you if you're white, too, but it's way disproportionate on people of color, just like everything in the racialized system of capitalism in the United States. Okay, so... As I mentioned, COVID-19, serious disease. I feel like we just need to revisit this. Um, every one of us probably has at least one person in your friends or family who's like, no, man, it's caused by 5G. The masks are a sign that you're a cuck. This is the final battle. They're trying to get us to wear masks. Uh, you know, more people die of the seasonal flu. It's just a bad cold. Well, there's an image of your lungs on covid I'm not even going to show you the really graphic pictures of autopsies of COVID, but go look up COVID lung. Go look up COVID autopsy findings, because what what some uh, doctors think now is that COVID, obviously it affects the lungs, but they're thinking it might be primarily a blood vessel disorder, which is the reason for the many sort of bizarre symptoms, including blood clots and kidney damage and even the way that it affects the lungs it may be primarily targeting all the capillaries in the lungs, the small blood vessels. So um, as we know, of course, the lungs are, you know, where your blood picks up oxygen. So there's a lot, a lot of blood vessels in your lungs to exchange, you know, the gases out of the air into your blood. Okay. A little like middle school bio uh, <laughs> refresher there. But, uh, and it's not a flu. It's, I mean, the coronavirus is in the same family of viruses as the flu. This isn't a flu. It, it shuts down your lungs. Like, it dramatically reduces uh, your, your body's ability to breathe, essentially. It just shuts down lung function. So, very serious. Wear the mask. Do social distancing, etc. Now, there have been waves. There was a first wave. Uh, number of cases, it went up believe it peaked in early April in the United States. Other countries that did a really, well, they did three things. They did a thorough shutdown, not a half-assed, do it if you feel like it shut down. They did extensive testing. The United States did not do this. I mean, it was hard to get a COVID test. And then three, if you test positive, 14-day quarantine taken care of by the government, not like do it if you feel like it, like you had Chris Cuomo out there, uh, like, you know, making this big spectacle of himself on uh, on CNN, like I'm quarantining. And then it turns out he like left his house like several times, not just not just left the basement, but like left the house entirely a bunch of times. So, yeah, um, you know, the United States did not do the three evidence based things that are really important that that countries did as you can see this graphic a lot of people a lot of places got their first wave way under control this isn't the first thing they've dealt with this is basically SARS part 2 SARS was a uh, similar coronavirus uh respiratory illness that was potentially fatal um that went around about 15 years ago in the mid, mid early mid 2000s and uh, so Asia already had systems for this kind of thing. The United States literally is still debating if the thing is real. 
So, you know, that's how far behind the United States is. Sadly, and that's why I think these uh, reopen protests, you know, and the sort of conspiracy theories, I don't like to use that term and the bourgeoisie do do conspiracies to stay in power. Uh, this isn't one of them. This is a real disease. So what we can see from these curves is that the countries that half-assed it, like the United States, really didn't have a sharp reduction after that initial peak in early April. Okay, well, now we see, as we're getting into mid-June, that uh, places have decided, hey, we've been shut down for long enough. Let's just reopen. What are we seeing? We're seeing the start of a second wave. It's still too early to call, but... I mean, it'll be callable, I think, in another week. The curves are just going dramatically up in places like Florida and Arizona and other places that have been a little more lenient with this whole situation. And they want, you know, people to go to to the beach because of tourism and, well, not so much in Arizona. But you know what I'm saying? It's warm weather. Uh, This is when seasonal businesses do a lot of their business and they want to you know, the government uh, exists for the bourgeoisie in this country, and uh, that's who they're catering to. Um, well, so we're going to get a second wave that's probably going to crest far worse than the first. Um, and it is in part due to the pressure that was, you know, people were just coming out of the woodwork. Karen needs to get her hair cut, et cetera to uh, just reopen businesses and like, you know, that's the price of liberty and all this stuff. And it's like, well, you know, if your government, even like in the the founding documents of the United States, it's supposed to be about life, liberty, and the pursuit of property later changed to happiness. Well, life is the first thing there. (laughs) Like you have an inalienable right to life. Um. This sort of flies in the face of that when you're just like, yeah, there's a potentially lethal organ damaging disease going around. Um, That's that's, uh, you know, (laughs) that's your life. I I don't know how to explain. I really don't know how to explain that to people who don't already get that. But I tried. Okay, so let's get into the articles now about. Who's been funding these things? Because they are astroturfed by the very rich. I'm sorry, this thing is all over the place. I'm a little out of practice of doing these videos. But just like the Tea Party, okay, back in 2008, that was astroturfed by the very rich. Why? Because it was basically a libertarian type, uh, proto-fascist, you know, response to the 2008 crash and bailout that could have taken on a much more left-wing character had the left been more developed at that time and had had the right been more subdued. It wasn't. And we're seeing with these reopen protests that they are bankrolled in a very similar way uh, as to what was going on with the Tea Party back in 08, 09, and 10. Okay, so what are we looking at here? We have an article I pulled from the Wonket site. Uh, By the way, if you hear more background noise, I'm in sort of a poorly ventilated attic. I had to open a window because it was just getting really hot. Uh, Pro-infection rallies, i.e. the reopen ones, are AstroTurf all the way down. This is from April 21st, uh, showing some pictures from the Idaho Capitol. And getting into the article, quote, as small numbers of right-wing loons keep showing up to tell the rest of America that a few hundred people in various states demand the immediate opportunity to infect the rest of us, it's worth pointing out that unlike the virus itself, these protests have been artificially engineered. Behind the idiots who willingly go out to show how happy they are to catch a disease, there are a whole bunch of right-wing groups that are dedicated to the rhetorically weird proposition that Donald Trump must be reelected to keep us safe from all Democratic governors and insufficiently far-right Republicans who aim to take away our freedom by preventing the wider spread of a deadly pandemic. There may be only a few hundred protesters at each rally, but the right-wing media sphere, especially Fox News, is doing all it can to pretend this tiny minority of Americans are mainstream. At least uh, this time around, many media outlets have caught on to the sham early and have pointed out just how inorganic this movement is. The Washington Post, for example, offers a close look at how three pro-gun brothers from the Midwest have been behind a series of groups on Facebook that promote not following public health orders. That story and many others 
have noted that the recent pro-virus protests in Michigan have been promoted by Republican-aligned groups, including one that's connected to Donald Trump's education secretary, Betsy DeVos. In Idaho, the local media have prominently noted that last Friday's protest at the state capitol building was organized by right-wing political groups, one of which promotes an anti-vaccine agenda. Anti-vaxxers also showed up at a rally in Pennsylvania, quote, Jesus is my vaccine, is one of the mo- more colorful messages here. That's from Miguel Marquez. Now, of course, uh, this is a very liberal blog, so, you know, as socialists, there may be points here or there we don't uh, necessarily invest in, but the overall reporting about the astroturfing is what we're looking at. Um, the Washington, oh, and as far as the brothers being pro gun, uh, I did look into, like, I tried to find a little bit more about these guys' political leanings. There is, like, a um, Idaho, if you search on that guy, Aaron Dorr, um, there's, uh, there's a website where he does lots and lots of gun activism. Honestly, I went through the site looking for anything, like, a little more interesting than that. It really is pretty neutral gun um, activism as far as I could tell. Uh, I mean, it's strongly couched in like constitutionalist reactionary terms, but um, I didn't find, I mean, they were pretty good about sticking to the subject at least. The Washington Post story on the gun humpers behind multiple Facebook groups is a model for how reporting on the pro-death rally should be done. Not only does it trace the group's origins to three right-wing brothers, Ben, Christopher, and Aaron Dorr, it also points out that the online groups appear to violate Facebook's own rules on spreading misinformation about the virus and emphasizes that however much noise these guys and their pals make, the reopen America bullshit is only supported by a tiny minority of Americans. Quote, the online activity by the instigated by the brothers helps cement the impression that opposition to the restrictions is more widespread than polling suggests. Nearly 70 percent of Republicans said they supported a national stay at home order, according to a recent Quinnipiac poll. Ninety five percent of Democrats backed such a measure in the survey. The story also points out that Trump's own calls to liberate states with Democratic governors are in complete opposition to his own health advisors' guidelines for ending the lockdowns. Comment, and of course, this thing was kind of the beginning of Trump's re-election campaign. I don't know how well that is going exactly. Back to the article, quote, The private Facebook group started by the doors all just sound a teensy bit familiar. Quote, Wisconsinites against excessive quarantine bizarre uh quote was created on wednesday by ben door his brother christopher is the creator of pennsylvanians except against excessive quarantine as well as ohioans against excessive quarantine a third brother aaron is the creator of new yorkers against excessive quarantine each group promotes a load of bullshit about the pandemic suggesting it's merely the flu or that scientists are all politically motivated And, of course, push the idea that governors seeking to limit the spread of a virus are just like Hitler. And how's this for a coincidence? In addition to promoting rallies, the Facebook groups also steer readers to the various pro-gun organizations the Door Brothers also happen to run. The Wisconsinites Against Excessive Quarantine Facebook group suggests you check out, quote, the Wisconsin Firearms Coalition, where people can enter their names, email addresses, and other contact information and share their views with the state's governor. In doing so, they encourage visitors who are not already a member of the Wisconsin Firearms Coalition to join us. A page asking users to join the Minnesota group offered several several rates for membership from $35 to $1,000. Same deal for the Pennsylvania group, too. Now, I mean, that's effective organizing, but of course what they're funneling it into is these white armed militias storming state capitals that, um, you know, of course, wouldn't fly if it were uh, not, you know, white supremacists in a white supremacist country doing that. And of course, thankfully, thank God we are seeing uh, left wing uprisings taking the place of that now. I think this would have been a much more depressing story to do in the absence of that. So actually, we mentioned Idaho in the last story there. Um, This brief piece has a tie in there. This is from Heavy.com on April 23rd. Sarah Brady, Idaho woman arrested over playdate coronavirus protest. 
Um, this is a woman who was basically arrested uh, on, on an Idaho playground. Um, here's one of the facts from it. Brady has spoken out against state immunization requirements and founded the group Idahoans for Vaccine Freedom. Brady is a well-known figure in the Meridian community. She runs the Facebook group Idahoans for Vaccine Freedom and was previously associated with Health Freedom Idaho, a group that advocates for greater choice regarding medical decisions. The organizers, organization's executive director clarified that she has not been associated with them since last year. Brady made headlines in 2017 in a dispute related to her decision not to vaccinate her own children. She enrolled her son at a private kindergarten that year after he was denied entry into a public school. Brady explained to the Idaho statesman that year that she did not want to fill out the exemption form the school required because it asked for information not required by state law. Instead, Brady wrote a statement explaining why she did not vaccinate her child. Her statement was written on a copy of the Idaho immunization statute, etc. So this is a white woman in Idaho uh, involved with the anti-vaccine efforts um, there who then a couple years later gets arrested on an Idaho playground despite shutdown orders for her not to be bringing her children there. This is during April, uh, basically when the U.S. was still like scrambling, trying to get things shut down and get people to go along with that. And she decided this is the stand she was going to make. This is the hill to die on for her. And, um, you know, as far as the tie-in with the anti-vaccine thing, I think that there is maybe a valid issue or two. First of all, get vac vaccinated. That's a good thing to do um, for the most part. Uh, there are some vaccines that they come up with that maybe are not super essential, but there are a lot of really serious diseases that have been eradicated because of vaccines. Um, you know, I've heard one or two possibly valid issues around vaccines, such as like a lack of liability for corporate manufacturers. Fine. Um, but, you know, unless the activism is within that kind of framework exclusively, um, I just I just don't see it. And so you get here, somebody who's like, yeah, my kids aren't going to get vaccinated, blah, blah, blah. And then they're also <laughs> running up against a stay at home order over another, you know, disease related issue. Um I think that there's a major problem here. It's it's outside outside the scope of this video, I think, but of the kind of fear mongering and hysteria that has been whipped up. If you peel back a few layers on this vaccine issue, which is why I bring this up, really, um, I had somebody, you know, somebody I used to know, apparently, um, <laughs> who was telling me like, no, dude, the, the covid thing like, um, and granted, I, I hadn't talked to this person in a while in a while previously, but the COVID thing, if you look up the patent on the vaccine, it's like number like six, six, six. And this vaccine that they're going to microchip everybody. And like, look, I have heard stories about, um, you know, digital proof of disease status and things like that. That stuff is possibly addressable within an anti-capitalist framework. Um, for, but that's not what these people's politics are. And there's a huge amount of just reactionary fear mongering that ultimately just benefits the 1%. So, you know, for the people in that orbit, uh, if you don't like being farmed and just basically milked for your labor on an ongoing basis, given nothing but the bare amount of crumbs to get you from one year to the next, while people get super rich off of that work. If that bothers you, it's time to change your politics. Some of these things, you know, you're trying to defend yourself and defend your family. Very good. You know, we all in the socialist world want better living standards, more of the better things in life for working people. That's not something we disagree on. But this kind of insane contrarian, um, you're picking the wrong battles. That's, that's, I guess, what I'm trying to tell you. All right, now let's get back to the funding articles. Okay, so first up, we have an article from The Guardian, April 17th. The right-wing groups behind wave of protests against COVID-19 restrictions. Protesters in Michigan and other states claim to speak for ordinary citizens, but are also supported by street-fighting far-right groups. 
A wave of planned anti-lockdown demonstrations that have broken out around the country to protest against the efforts of state governments to combat the coronavirus pandemic with business closures and stay-at-home orders have included far-right groups as well as more mainstream Republicans. While protesters in Michigan, Ohio, Kentucky, and other states claim to speak for ordinary citizens, many are also supported by street-fighting right-wing groups like the Proud Boys, conservative armed militia groups, religious fundamentalists, anti-vaccination groups, and other elements of the radical right. On Wednesday in Lansing, Michigan, a protest put together by two Republican-connected not-for-profits was explicitly devised to cause gridlock in the city and for a time blocked the entrance to a local hospital. It was organized by the Michigan Conservative Coalition, which Michigan state corporate filings show has also operated under the name of Michigan Trump Republicans. It was also heavily promoted by the Michigan Freedom Fund, a group linked to the Trump cabinet member Betsy DeVos. But the protest also attracted far-right protest groups who have been present at pro-Trump and gun rights rallies in Michigan throughout the Trump presidency. Placards identified the Michigan Proud Boys as participants in the vehicle convoy. Near the State House, local radio interviewed a man who identified himself as Phil Odinson. In fact, the man is Phil Robinson, the prime mover in a group called the Michigan Liberty Militia, whose Facebook page features pictures of firearms, warnings of civil war, celebrations of Norse paganism, and memes ultimately sourced from white nationalist groups like Patriot Front. The protest has been heavily promoted by the Idaho Freedom Foundation, which counts among its donors dark money funds linked to the Koch brothers such as Donors Capital Fund and Castle Rock, a foundation seeded with part of the fortune of Adolf Coors, the right-wing beer magnate. Comment, in case you don't know that, the Coors Beer Company, it's like, that guy's a fascist. Okay. Quote, IFF have added their slogan for the event, disobey Idaho to stickers which they plan to distribute among the crowd. The event is also being promoted on a website dedicated to attacking Little for his response to COVID-19. That website was set up by the Idaho businessman, pastor, and one-time Republican state Senate candidate Diego Rodriguez. Rodriguez launched the website at an Easter service held in defiance of the governor's orders on Easter Sunday, which was also addressed by Ammon Bundy. Wow. The leader of the militia occupation of the Malheur National Wildlife Refuge in 2016 that became a rallying point for the anti-government right in the U.S. Comment. You may remember that, that the Bundys, those were the uh, people who just like occupied a federal park <laughs> and uh, uh, just were like, this is our land now. And the government just didn't do anything about it. OK, quote, Bundy has been holding similar gatherings for weeks in Emmett, Idaho, where he now lives. On Sunday, he repeated his opposition to the Idaho orders, writing on Facebook, quote, we all have a duty to defend what is right and to make sure that what God has given man does not take away, especially that great gift of agency. Yes, freedom, unquote. Atta County, Idaho, where the capital Boise is located, has so far suffered 541 cases of COVID-19 and nine deaths. Comment, of course, the 541 tested cases, adequate testing is still not available and really wasn't at the time of this article returning in a state which has a far worse outbreak than neighboring Oregon, which has 2.4 times, which is 2.4 times more populous. Nevertheless, the ad for the rally on Rodriguez's website advises, quote, we feel that wearing masks, face masks and gloves is counterproductive to the movement and should be avoided. So comment, in other words, get as close as you can to each other with no protection. You know, I mean, he stopped short of, you know, lick each other's faces, but. OK, returning to the article, quote, in Washington state, meanwhile, which for now has brought one of the worst outbreaks in the country under a measure of control, a Republican state committeeman, Tyler Miller, has organized a protest at the state capitol on Saturday. Miller, who is active in the Kitsap County Republican Party, was involved in passing a resolution in January in support of Representative Matt Shea, who was excluded from the state house's GOP caucus after a report commissioned by the House found that he had participated in domestic terrorism. Hundreds of Facebook users have indicated that they will be attending his, quote, hazardous liberty rally and a parallel event in Richland, Washington. 
Included in that number are members of the Three Percenters of Washington, a group which has held a series of open carry rallies in Seattle, featuring speeches from the far-right protest leader Joey Gibson. As for Shea, he is speaking on Saturday at an online Saving America conference, which will discuss an alleged erosion of rights that's been ramped up in unprecedented ways during this COVID-19 crisis. Comment, that's exactly what I was talking about before. Um... This whole like fear mongering and hysteria about, you know, various things related to people's freedoms. Um, you're fighting the wrong battle. You're just if you're buying into this, uh, you're fighting the wrong battle. Please see our other videos for a better explanation of of how this kind of politics ultimately does not serve you if you're a working class person. OK, back to the article, quote, he is scheduled to appear alongside the likes of close ally Pastor Ken Peters, who has been holding monthly services outside Spokane's Planned Parenthood Clinic, the actor, MAGA personality and congressional candidate Mindy Robinson, and the New Zealand-based anti-communist speaker and author Trevor Loudon. Other similar events have been advertised for Saturday by an anti-vaccination activist in Oregon and for Friday by a Boston group with alt-right connections. Now, going into another uh, article from The Guardian, actually from the next day. This one is headlined, Thousands of Americans Backed by Right-Wing Donors Gear Up for Protests. Yet, uh, so going into the article, While organizers claim the protests are grassroots and people-driven, a closer look reveals a movement driven by traditional right-wing groups, including one funded by the family of Trump's education secretary, Betsy DeVos. The rallies have drawn comparisons to the Tea Party movement, which sprang into life in 2009 following the election of Barack Obama and was driven in part by Americans for Prosperity, a group founded by right-wing donors Charles and David Koch, or Koch as I prefer to call them. As with the Tea Party, the anti-stay-at-home movement has been promoted by a right-wing media eager for the economy to reopen, including Fox News, which on Friday aired a segment on protests in Virginia, Michigan, and Minnesota. Two minutes later, Trump tweeted to his 77.4 million followers the need to, quote, liberate those states. Comment, side note, um, many of Trump's followers are bots and fake, so there's that. And many also pe many people also follow him just to heckle him. Okay, back to the article, quote, A majority of Americans support the lockdowns with a Pew Research Center poll finding that 66% of Americans are concerned state governments will lift restrictions on public activity too quickly. But protests helped by media coverage have spread around the country. The two groups behind the Operation Gridlock rally in Michigan on Wednesday have ties to the Republican Party and the Trump administration. The Michigan Freedom Fund, which said it was a co-host to the rally, has received more than five, well, five hundred thousand dollars, half a million dollars from the DeVos family, regular donors to right wing groups. The other host, the Michigan Conservative Coalition, was founded by Matt Maddock now a Republican member of the State House of Representatives. The MCC also operates under the name Michigan Trump Republicans and in January held an event featuring several members of the Trump campaign. Quote, absolutely, the Michigan event was a huge inspiration and it was a huge success, said E.V. Harris, organizer of a reopen Maryland protest planned for the state capitol on Saturday. That was the model for our event. While reopen Maryland might not have had funding from right-wing advocacy groups, it appears to be linked to at least four other reopen organizations. Quote, government mandating sick people to stay home is called quarantine, reopen Maryland said. Quote, however, the government mandating healthy citizens to stay home, forcing businesses and churches to close, is called tyranny. Comment, this is called not understanding how disease spreads because... There's not testing. We don't know who has it. You can have it for 14 days without showing symptoms. That's how COVID works biologically. Anyway, uh, so you can be sick and not know it. So unless people are getting tested on a daily basis with instant results, which is not possible, you're not going to know. So this is the only way to prevent it right now. Unfortunately, it's unfortunate in many ways, but that's the reality of it. OK, quote, that text is identical to text on Facebook groups calling for rallies in Wisconsin, Pennsylvania and Virginia. Reopen Virginia aims to hold its own gridlock rally on Wednesday, again inspired by the conservative funded Michigan event. 
Despite Reopen Virginia billing itself as a, quote, grassroots groups of, group of people and small business owners, founder Kristen Lynn Hall said the idea for the protest came from the organizers of the Lobby Day demonstration earlier this year. That demonstration was organized by the Virginia Citizens Defense League, a gun rights group that has donated tens of thousands of dollars to politicians. Now, skipping ahead a little bit, a decade ago, the Tea Party movement billed itself as grassroots, despite receiving money from the Koch-backed Americans for Prosperity and the conservative organization FreedomWorks. Jenny Beth Martin, who founded the Tea Party Patriots group, promoted this week's Michigan protest. The Tea Party Patriots also supported the protest in messages to its 200,000 Twitter followers. Matthew Gertz, a senior fellow at Media Matters for America, a progressive media watchdog, said that the similarities between the Tea Party and reopen movements went further with right-wing media boosting both. Fox News ran favorable coverage of the Michigan rally and hosts, including Laura Ingraham and Janine Pirro, endorsed the event. Quote, Fox gave the Tea Party a phenomenal amount of attention and promotion, Gertz said. It really sort of bootstrapped it to another level and made it a political force. And we see something similar happening with these anti-stay-at-home order movements. Gertz said he was not simply concerned with the conservatives having a strong election next time out, but with uh, the spreading of a major serious disease. Okay, now we are on to a New York Times article called Who's Behind the Reopen Protest? They are anything but spontaneous. This is April 22nd. Quote, the Tea Party, formed after America elected its first black president. Actually, it really wasn't about that. Uh, as I mean, at least I, rem I remember comment now. <laughs> um, I mean, there may have been undertones of that, but uh, that was I remember the Tea Party's like founding statement. There was like some guy went on T Fox, I think, and did a rant. It was about the economic crash, as I recall. It's been 10 years. I have not watched it since then, but I remember it being about the economic crash and bailout specifically. But you know, so continuing my comment here, I mean, something I'll comment on at the end of this is we're looking at corporate liberal news sort of like trying to make sense of all this stuff. So anyway, I'll, I'll include some of that in my commentary, but getting back to this. So just like I said earlier, take it with something of a grain of salt. OK, quote, the Tea Party formed after America elected its first black president used a series of health care town halls to spur angry Republicans to oppose the Affordable Care Act as a socialist takeover of American medicine. Little matter that it was modeled on a plan devised by Mitt Romney, a Republican, when he was the governor of Massachusetts. Such false claims about the act have not aged well as millions of Americans now depend on the law for health care coverage as the coronavirus contagion sweeps across the nation. And yet a Tea Party co-founder, Mark Meckler, is using the same tactics and same phony claims to stir his followers to protest against governors seeking to mitigate the COVID-19 death toll by closing businesses and banning public gatherings. Look no further than the first protest organized by the Michigan Conservative Coalition and the Michigan Freedom Fund, whose chairman manages the vast financial investments of Dick and Betsy DeVos, the education secretary, to see that the campaign to open America flows from the super rich and their front groups. Stephen Moore, a fellow at the Heritage Foundation, a Koch ally and a Trump advisor, admitted as much in a video I obtained comparing these new protesters to Rosa Parks. Mr. Moore, who is now leading an enterprise to end the virus precautions called Save Our Country, which includes the Koch-backed American Legislative Exchange Council, or ALEC, the, uh, comment, these are conservatives who write like boilerplate legislation that they then force onto the politicians that they funded um, to like rubber stamp for them. But the, the legislators aren't writing it, Alex, uh, ALEC is, and then they're just having these people... Um, so when we talk about getting corporate money, you know, out of politics and why, like for me, you know, the Bernie Sanders thing for me as a socialist, why I could support that coalition of far left to more social democratic people. He didn't take the corporate money and there was at least a chance of getting some like non corporate think tank policies, uh, at least injected into the national discussion. But that's exactly what you see here. And that's true of both Republican and Democrat. OK, which includes the Koch backed American Legislative Exchange Council boasted that he has been working behind the scenes with a conservative donor 
who agreed to cover bail and legal fees for demonstrators who get arrested for defying Wisconsin's virus protective measures. Others are providing legal assistance as well. The Times reports that a private Facebook group called Reopen North Carolina has retained the legal services of Michael Best and Friedrich, a Wisconsin law firm whose clients include President Trump. The firm is well known for its work with dark money groups that fought the recall of the Koch ally, Governor Scott Walker of Wisconsin, and waged war on unions. Then there's the Convention of States, established in 2015 with a big contribution from the conservative hedge fund billionaire Robert Mercer. The group recruits activists at gun shows to support a balanced budget amendment and is promoting the protests online via Open the States. COS is an offshoot of Citizens for Self-Governance, which Mr. Meckler co-founded with a longtime Koch operative, Eric O'Keefe. COS and a Koch Finance public relations firm in pursuit of are also purchasing domain names tied to protests to open the states, suggesting they're investing for a long battle, even as the death toll rises. Comment, uh, the country is now in a massive uprising. I think that these people have been eclipsed for the time being, but this is what they would like anyway. All right. Quote, the consequences are already starting. One week after a Kentucky protest, the state experienced its largest spike in coronavirus cases. Other states may soon see similar spikes. Comment, I don't have the article in front of me. However, uh, I believe it was the New York Post I saw it reported in. There was a study um, that showed that the George Floyd protesters, uh, those protests have not been linked to spikes in coronavirus cases so far. So, again, you have people here saying, you know, trying to downplay the disease, not wearing masks, not distancing. Um, we get spikes. You have people who are out there for much better reasons, taking care of each other, general for social justice, uh, not having spikes in coronavirus afterward. So, quote, those fanning these flames and including President Trump and Fox News hosts, are unlikely to get burned by infection themselves, though they may be goading their followers to risk their health by attending mass demonstrations. America is now facing three calamities, a deadly contagion, a capricious president, my God, and a well-funded right-wing infrastructure willing to devalue human life in pursuit of its political agenda. Some very rich men and women are making this medical disaster worse through their reckless bellows and flaming people to demand that states open now, no matter how, how many lives that costs. Okay, I am having trouble talking today, as you can tell. I'm definitely out of practice on this. But let's leave it at that. There are many more articles about, you know, that um, will have most of the same narrative and then an additional unique detail or two. Suffice to say, clearly the reopen protests, like the Tea Party, are being funded by billionaires. If you buy into them, you're being taken for a ride. Why? So billionaires can get an extra few billion dollars. That's why. And if you're working class, there's just nothing for you here. But my closing notes on this, you know, we're socialists. We're not well represented in the media, to say the least. Um, all, you know, a Antifa has had a big... Um, you know, surge of interest, I guess you could say, uh, for participating in the George Floyd protests, for, you know, defending Black Lives Matter people and for just generally getting out there and helping to fuck shit up and to stop uh, white supremacists and other people from getting involved in the protests in a bad way. We've seen a few instances of uh, right wingers trying to instigate shit um, and turn these protests sour. Uh, Antifa has been out there. And I think that we have shown a lot of people that Antifa on the streets um, can be very effective allies of working class people of color. Of course, you know, I say Antifa uh, allies of people of color. What I mean by that, first of all, many there are many people of color who are Antifa. So, th I mean, there's a narrative there. Let's debunk it right now that all Antifa are like white, young anarchities. That's not true. Communists are Antifa, anarchists are Antifa, and many communists and anarchists are not white, okay? It's uh, so hard to have a discussion in this country when the all the terminology is so loaded, so it's kind of like trying to unpack that while using these very loaded terms. Okay, so that's number one. Um, number two, 
there are a lot of Black Lives Matter protesters who are not radical. Um, they may be coming from more of a liberal place of anti-racism. And we as socialists should obviously respectfully encourage, you know, uh, for anti-racism in especially the United States where, with such an entrenched history of racial injustice embedded within its capitalism, you know, Good anti-capitalism needs to be anti-racist, and good anti-racism needs to be radical, needs to be anti-capitalist. So hopefully that can help unpack a little bit of those terms. But uh, the bigger point here is Antifa is not just about hitting the streets. It's, it's I mean, that's a, an occasional thing that pops up every now and then. Antifa also includes, it's, it's anti-fascism. So it's, it's doing research like this. It's sharing research like this. It's outing fascists in your community. It's all of that work, 90% of which is very unglamorous, involves staring at a screen, involves doing that kind of research, looking up business records, things like that. Okay, next point is that although some of this research can be used for anti-fascism you know, type of purposes as we're doing here to advance socialism, uh, these are coming from liberal outlets, obviously, The Guardian and The New York Times and, you know, all that kind of th these liberal capital corporate media outlets. Um, so let's not mistake The New York Times for being Antifa, because, of course, the liberals putting this stuff out there, it's framed in a very um, this is solely a Republican problem. So they want to reduce this issue, this conflict over how to handle coronavirus uh, to just a difference between two capitalist political parties, that the Republicans do it wrong and the Democrats do it right. So unfortunately, that's not the case, not just on COVID-19. I mean, you do see a better shutdown, uh, generally speaking, in Democratic-controlled states. So on this issue, they are a little bit better, um, and the Republicans are a bit more brazen in what they're doing. But the Democrats consistently advance this... Um, blind spot of of you know what is really going on trying to reduce what is and should be viewed as a conflict between classes a conflict a conflict between the capitalist class and the working class as a conflict between political parties which as we know it is not the case that we have one party for the owning class and one party for the working class we have two parties for the owning class, both of which, in their own way, also try to make claims to being a working class party. The Republicans, uh, long known as, you know, the country club, like wealthy, elitist, you know, more exclusionary type of party with some regional subsets and differences there. Uh, they have tried to, you know, make, make appeals to more racist blue collar workers etc. And as such, with this kind of pseudo populism or actual po populism, depending on how you view populism, I would kind of tend toward the latter. Populism is often racist, um, almost always racist. Uh, you know, they, they make their claim of sort of representing working class interests. Of course, they really don't. Uh, working class interests are socialist. We want to have control our work and and also own and control the fruits of our labor uh, as well. And Republicans are definitely not about that. And then the Democrats in putting up a mirage of being a more reformist, uh, quasi social democratic type party, although not really. I mean, they put up a better illusion of doing that. But that's basically the lie that the Democrats want to sell you is that you know, they will be slightly better than the Republicans while still advancing primarily 1% interests and saying we're the party of the working class. Well, they're not. Um, and, uh, you know, this is another thing that the Republicans feed off of with their populism. Oh, look at these rich liberal elites like Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer. And they're not wrong, but obviously Tucker Carlson and, uh, you know, Mitch McConnell and all these people are not like <laughs> common folk either. So, it's really just both of the two capitalist major political parties in the United States. It's a case of the pot calling the kettle black uh, in, in, you know, from both sides, really. Um, just this kind of selective vision. And, you know, that's something I feel like was worth mentioning in trying to unpack these uh, 
articles about the right, which you can use some of it for anti-fascist pur- purposes, but, you know, what was not mentioned in there is all of the many ways that the Democrats have also fallen down on this issue, just because the astroturfing of the Tea Party and these things come from the Koch brothers, that's safe for more Democrat, liberal-friendly stuff to report on. Anyway, I think you get the point. So I'm about to wrap this up. This is normally where I would have the call to action. Fortunately, for once in my goddamn life, there's already a lot of action going on. Uh, People are already in the streets, so the call to action is just an encouragement to keep it up this time. Keep it up. Keep hitting the streets. Um, There's great... I see less um, protest footage and news sharing on Facebook than I do on Twitter. So I would say if you're not already on Twitter, that's probably a better place than Facebook to get some protest news from. And of course, YouTube, you can't find a fucking thing anymore. They have totally shut down the YouTube search engine for quote unquote authoritative news. Um, Nine out of 10 things that you search for, it will just give you like Fox, CNN, you know, NBC and stuff like that. So Um, Twitter seems to be the best place to get protest news. So I encourage you to get involved with that and just get out there. You know, previously on COVID stuff, I was saying, you know, counter the reopen protests with pay us to stay home protests. We still need that. We still need better care. Um, we need relief for essential workers. So we still have demands that we need to be met. Um, but, uh, thankfully things are already happening. So it's not a question of getting them started. It's a question of keeping them going. Contribute to whatever is going on in your area. And I promise you by now, different from even probably a year or six months ago, there is stuff going on. As I was talking with Eric from Stone Socialist about in our interview last week, um, you know, he is in a small city in a more rural area and 600 people showed up for like a mutual aid thing. So get involved if you aren't already. If you are, keep it up. Good work. Uh, I think this stuff is going to go on all summer. The reopening the businesses is going to, is about to, well, it is starting up now and we're already seeing a rise in cases that probably is going to be a second peak, just like the Spanish flu a hundred years ago, which had three peaks. So there we are. Wear a mask, wash your hands, all that stuff. I'm going to stop talking and you will see more videos from socialism for all. A reminder before we leave, you can go to facebook.com slash socialism for all. Please follow us there. We're up to like 2250 likes now. That's really great. Um, We started, I only started plugging that in like January this year and I had 150 likes. So that's good. Um, And it's great to see people who show up regularly and comment. I appreciate you all in the community. You can also support this effort at patreon.com slash socialism for all for as little as a dollar a month i know everybody's budget is tight uh if you do have the money and you feel like kicking me some book money that's probably what i'm going to spend it on is is books and things related to uh to this podcast so i appreciate that a lot and uh thanks to our current patrons whose names are on the screen